Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jarvik Russell Award plenary session. I have the great pleasure today of introducing this year's winner of the Jarvik Russell Early Career Award, Dr. Jessica Barrington Tremis. Jessica is an assistant professor of preventive medicine in the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Jessica's work focuses on substance use, and as you'll see today, that includes e-cigarettes by youth and young adults. Jessica's accomplishments and accolades speak for themselves, and they would be truly impressive for someone at any level, but they are especially imp impressive for someone in an early career level. For context, Jessica received her PhD in epidemiology in 2014 and began her first faculty position just five years ago. Yet Jessica has published more than 110 peer-reviewed papers, and many of these publications are in very high-impact journals like JAMA and the New England Journal of Medicine. This work has had an undeniable influence on the field, and that's evidenced through the great number of citations of her papers. Jessica's H index is 35. Several of her papers have been cited hundreds of times, including one paper in JAMA Pediatrics that was a meta-analysis that she co-authored, which has been cited nearly 700 times. Some of this work has been included in policy informing documents like the Surgeon General's report on e-cigarettes and the NASM report. Her grant funding is also impressive. It includes an R01, a K01, a tobacco-related disease research program of California award. She is a co-I on several R01s. She leads her own project within a funded T-Cores, and she has numerous pending R01s. As demonstrated in the SRNT pre-conference survey that Megan presented on yesterday, we as SRNT members are more divided on e-cigarettes than on some other issues. Jessica let, Jessica's letter writers note, and I agree, that regardless of where you stand on these issues, it's impossible to discount the influence that Jessica's research has had on how we think about these products and on their role in public health. Despite the fact that sometimes, for some researchers, e-cigarettes can be contentious, Jessica has always maintained the utmost level of respect and professionalism for her colleagues, and that's a quality that I really admire. One element of Jessica's CV that really stood out to me as unique is her devotion at this early stage to mentoring. Many of her letter writers, maybe all of them, noted that this is an extraordinary contribution to the field, and I counted more than 40 of her publications were led by mentees. Although Jessica clearly has a long and exciting career ahead of her, it's clear from her devotion to training that her contributions to this field will extend beyond her career through the careers of her mentees. I personally cannot think of anyone more qualified to receive this award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Barrington Tremis to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you so much for having me. I am truly honored to accept the 2022 Jarvik Russell Early Career Investigator Award. Today, my presentation will be called Smoke and Mirrors, Understanding the Public Health Impact of E-Cigarettes Among Youth. My research is supported by NCI, NIDA, FDA CTP, and the Tobacco Related Disease Research Program. As always, content here is my responsibility and doesn't represent the views of my funders. I'd like to start with a look at the progress we've made over the last 50 years and the story of how I came to find my way as a behavioral epidemiologist and tobacco regulatory scientist against a background of the prevalence of tobacco use among 12th grade students over this time. Data shown here are from 12th grade students in the Monitoring the Future study. My story begins in 1984, when I was born, and Nancy Reagan launched her campaign telling kids to just say no to drugs. Just a few years later, in 1989, my grandfather, who had been a lifelong smoker, had a quadruple bypass at the age of 54 due to problems very likely related to his smoking. That was what it took for him. He swore to himself that if he made it out of the surgery alive, he would quit smoking for good and never have another cigarette in his life. And he did. 
More than 32 years later, he's still with us and alive to share his stories with me. Here, we took him in his first convertible ride. Um, and in the second picture, I was teaching him how to take a selfie. <laughs> By the time I started middle school, smoking among high school students had risen to almost the same levels in the late 70s, when some of the first nationally representative surveys of the prevalence of youth smoking were conducted. The increase in the early to mid-90s was of concern, given the relatively stable rates through the 80s. In the late 90s, cigarette smoking among young people took a turn for the better, dropping rapidly, likely due in part to a series of tobacco control efforts that came into play around that time. By the time I graduated high school, only one in four 12th graders had reported smoking in the past 30 days. When I graduated from college, it was only one in five. Go bison. And when I started my PhD in epidemiology in 2011, around the same time my sister graduated from college, shown here, uh, smoking rates were still falling. I very much fell into this PhD program. Growing up, I had never known anyone who had a PhD, and I thought they were just for the super crazy smart people. After I got my master's in global medicine, which was my second master's degree, I was all set to start another master's in epidemiology when my program advisor, Dr. Ellie Nizami, told me to just do a PhD. I was skeptical, but when she told me that PhD programs were funded and that it would be silly to do a third master's, not to mention the ridiculous student loans that I would continue to accrue, I believed her and took her advice and just did it, having absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. My studies went well, and my advisor, Dr. Roberta McKean Cowden, was incredibly patient in teaching me essentially everything I needed to know about how to do research. I will forever be grateful that she took a chance on me and agreed to take me on as a new PhD student with absolutely no experience whatsoever. When I graduated, just a couple of years after my dad had gone back to school and earned his EDD, also at USC, uh, smoking rates were the lowest that they had been in decades. But what we were only just beginning to understand was that there was another nicotine product slowly making its way into the hands of youth across the country, one that would prove far more difficult to study and even harder to control. When I graduated, I wanted something more. The main public health message from my dissertation work was don't smoke. Yes, we had nuanced findings about gene environment interactions and kids who are more susceptible. We had a better understanding of mechanisms underlying the association of parental smoking and childhood cancer. But the bottom line was clear. Don't smoke, especially if you're pregnant. In my last semester, my soon-to-be mentor, Rob McConnell, approached me about potentially doing a postdoc with the newly funded USC Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science. He, again, took a chance on me. I'd never done any sort of tobacco regulatory science before. I didn't even know what tobacco regulatory science was. But I was interested. And so I did what I had always done. I jumped in head first with no idea what I was getting myself into. That summer in 2014, fresh PhD in hand, I attended my first e-cigarette convention in LA, where I was blown away by the vape scene and products which I had only just begun to learn about. Very quickly, this would become an area for substantial research and ongoing discussion, not only within the US, but globally. As e-cigarettes gained rapid popularity and rates began to climb, Rob, my postdoc mentor, said to me, look, this is a once in a lifetime experience. You'll probably never be at the center of an evolving epidemic like this again in your career. Uh, he was wrong, of course. <laughs> Um, but we didn't know back then that 2020 was going to throw another once-in-a-lifetime epidemic at us. So here we are in 2014, and while cigarette use continues to decline, e-cigarettes are starting to become more commonly used among young people. E-cigarettes are introduced in lots of interesting flavors, and they are customizable and personalizable. Very early on, Rob, a respiratory epidemiologist by training, began to worry about what people were actually inhaling. And we began to worry that these flavoring chemicals might be doing some damage to the lungs of young people, many of whom began using e-cigarettes with no history of tobacco use. 
We wrote a commentary to this effect, calling attention to the potential unrecognized respiratory health hazards of vaping and began a series of studies investigating these effects, which I don't have time to go into right now. And soon, I had a lot of questions about e-cigarettes and very few answers. With early trends in e-cigarette use, many were very optimistic that e-cigarettes might be a substitute for combustible cigarettes, perhaps replacing one of the deadliest products ever produced. This optimism was soon replaced with concern. What if e-cigarettes instead were drawing in new youth to tobacco product use? And what if kids just started with e-cigarettes and then transitioned to smoking combustible cigarettes? And importantly, why? This idea, the exploration of why, has been a guiding principle in my research. For every new thing we learn, I have more questions that I want answered. And this, for me, is what science is the pursuit of the why and the questioning of everything. As Ellen Ochoa remarked, curiosity is probably one of the most important characteristics that people have who go into science. So I began asking questions. Why do youth begin vaping? To start, it's worth looking at how e-cigarettes have evolved. E-cigarettes first came into the market in 2007, although they didn't gain widespread popularity among young people until about 2013 or 2014. They started with products that looked like cigarettes early on, to vape pens, to mods or box mods, then to Juul, of course, then to other pod mods, and more recently, disposable devices. The more recent devices often use salted nicotine formulations, which allow for very high levels of nicotine and efficient nicotine delivery, without many of the harsh effects typical of highly concentrated nicotine solutions. As Juul gained rapid popularity, I became concerned about the risks of high nicotine content use among young people. So I wrote a commentary highlighting these concerns, calling attention to this new class of products that were not only very high in nicotine content, but could also be easily concealed from authority figures. And in an invited editorial around the same time, we discussed some of our ongoing concerns with advertising of these new products. And yes, I was very pleased to have the phrase unicorn puke alongside an image of a unicorn puking in a scientific paper. The cartoons and memes have continued with many criticizing the potential appeal of these products to young people. You sell your products in cherry crush and vanilla flavors. Cherry crush. How can you sit here and say you're not marketing to children? And when talking about youth, I share that concern. In several studies to date, and I won't go into the details of all of these here, youth have reported flavors as a key reason for initiation. One participant in one of our qualitative studies said, I just like the flavors. It's the flavors and the cool tricks you can do. But then I felt the head change. I kind of like that. Flavors other than tobacco are extremely popular among young people who use e-cigarettes. In this publication, using the 2019 data from 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in the Monitoring the Future study, when all Juul flavors were available, we found that mint was the most commonly used flavor among youth, followed by mango. Shortly after the study came out, Juul pulled their mint flavor, along with their other non-tobacco flavors. And in early two, uh, 2020, the FDA finalized their enforcement policy on unauthorized flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes that restricted the availability of flavors. Also around the same time, in January 2020, a PhD student who I work with, who just defended two weeks ago, Dr. Sam Swalina, uh, was visiting a vape shop where she learned about a new product called Puff Crush that was a flavored pod attachment compatible with Juul. So we wrote a commentary. And with the continued focus on flavors and ongoing considerations regarding flavor bans, we again sought to know more, again asking why. This time, I put together a discrete choice-based task to really understand the product characteristics that are most important to young people. This task shows participants examples of real-world products that vary in a number of different characteristics to assess implicit decision-making, giving us information on the characteristics that are most important to participants. In the first part of this task, participants are asked to select whether they would or would not possibly buy the product shown, given the characteristics of the product. 
Then, when products, then the products are pitted against one another, and participants select the product that they like best in sets of three. We did this task with the disposable product, but then also with an e-liquid and a pod-based product. We looked at several different product attributes, including flavor, package design, nicotine level, warning label size, nicotine type, and price. This paper was led by Matt Stone, a postdoc working with my team. We found that flavor was the most important characteristic of e-cigarettes in a sample of young adult e-cigarette users, followed by nicotine level and price. In this graph, the orange negative values represent dislike of a certain level within a given attribute, like flavor, and the green bars indicate preference for those levels. Here in the very first um, set of, of the graph on the left, uh, we see the participants greatly dislike tobacco flavor. I know the, uh, the words are a little hard to read. Um, and preferred mint or mango, which are the two green bars that are rising up. Participants also preferred 5% nicotine and did not want the very low nicotine content e-cigarettes. And of course, with price, participants preferred lower priced e-cigarettes when given the option. As we continue to learn more about e-cigarettes and young people, I continue to ask questions. A pressing question, of course, is what are the adverse consequences of youth vaping? There are several key concerns that I'm worried about. First, do kids start using e-cigarettes and then become addicted, potentially leading to a lifetime of nicotine addiction? We heard in our qualitative interviews with young people that they were concerned about their dependence on, on nicotine vaping and clearly exhibited symptoms of dependence. Shown here are a few representative quotes that were included in a recent paper led by another PhD student working with my team, Kelsey Simpson. The distress was clear. I wish I was able to measure how much I was vaping. I have no idea how much nicotine I'm taking in. I really don't. I always have it, so I don't even really know how often I'm ripping it. And when I started vaping, I just found myself using it all the time. With the cigarettes, at least I'd have to get up, go outside, light the cigarette, and then put it out and walk back in. It's a whole process. I could just be sitting there doing homework, and I'm just vaping, and I'm like, hold up, this is supposed to help me quit? I rip it so many times throughout the day that I'm scared to stop. The worst thing is, like, first thing in the morning, it's under my pillow. This is my rock bottom. It's under my pillow when I sleep, so I can use it first thing in the morning. And on Twitter, people were talking about using cigarettes to quit Juul and reflecting on their feelings of dependence. But nicotine dependence is not the only concern with youth vaping. I also worried, of course, about whether young people might transition to other types of tobacco products, including those far more harmful than e-cigarettes. This wasn't an uncommon finding, both in our qualitative work. For example, we had one um, person say, there's this weird pendulum push with a lot of people I know where they started with cigarettes, went to Juul to help them get off of cigarettes, but became way more addicted to nicotine with Juul, so now they're going back to cigarettes. And we saw a lot of this in our quantitative work as well. In an early meta-analysis that I had the opportunity to collaborate on, led by my colleague, Dr. Samir Seneji, we found that those who used e-cigarettes had 3.5 times the odds of subsequently initiating combustible cigarette use. Of course, kids try lots of things, so I also wanted to know whether they might progress to more frequent smoking. And we found that those who began with e-cigarettes were not only more likely to just try smoking, but progressed on a similar or heavier trajectory toward more, um, a similar or heavier trajectory of combustible cigarette use following e-cigarette use, uh, particularly if they were using more efficient uh, e-cigarette delivery devices. But cigarette use has continued to decline among young people overall, and I think it's critically important that we not lose perspective in the overall tobacco landscape and the progress that our field continues to make. In a paper last year, we reported the prevalence of lifetime daily smoking rates among young people aged 22 to 23 at the time of survey. And you can see a substantial decline over this time, which is statistically significant. And importantly, when we look at the data on age of initiation, we see increases overall in the age of smoking initiation. In 2018, more than 40% of ever smokers currently aged 22 to 23 had begun smoking at age 18 or older, and nearly 60% had begun to smoke daily in early adulthood, not adolescence, which decreases their risk of lifelong dependence on cigarette smoking. Again, a very positive impact for public health. 
The tobacco landscape, of course, continues to change, and it's worth continued discussion regarding how the field is evolving. Last year, some e-cigarette companies began to market their products as tobacco-free. Given the potential implications of doing so, both in evading federal policy and perhaps the reduced harm perception associated with e-cigarette use for kids, Sam and I got together with Rob and Neil Benowitz and wrote a commentary alerting the public health community to our concerns with this new marketing tactic. We began to see this marketing everywhere. Companies were marketing their products as tobacco-free and changing their warning labels to state that their products contain tobacco-free nicotine. In California, we saw less of this anecdotally, which may have been due to the differential regulations in our state, where, many, where any nicotine-containing products, regardless of where the nicotine is from, are considered tobacco products for state policy purposes. Federally, however, until very recently, FDA only had jurisdiction over products made or derived from tobacco, which technically didn't include synthetic nicotine products. As I think many of you know, this week, President Joe Biden signed into law a spending bill giving the FDA authority over synthetic nicotine, redefining a tobacco product as any product made or derived from tobacco or containing nicotine from any source. And it will be interesting to see what happens with the marketing of synthetic nicotine products. We've noticed differences in the appeal of products, in the appeal of products that use the tobacco-free language. In an experiment that we did among young adults in our cohort, we randomized participants to view one of four images depicting an online marketplace for disposable e-cigarettes. Two images were of Puff Bar, shown here, the left using tobacco-free language, which is what is currently on their website, and the right using the language before synthetic products were marketed. To isolate the effects of the tobacco-free language specifically and not simply due to Puff Bar, two other analogs were shown for a fictional product, the Zeus Bar. Images differed in the warning label at the top, the description of the product, and the warning label on the product itself. In preliminary analyses, our participants indicated a preference for the synthetic nicotine products, even after accounting for product name with a higher score given for the question, would you use this product? The field continues to evolve, and it's hard to say what product will become the next new in thing among young people. So we continue to monitor the data. This past fall, we surveyed ninth and 10th grade students in Southern California and found, not unexpectedly, that e-cigarettes were still the most commonly used nicotine product among young people. But what was perhaps more, more surprising is that flavored nicotine gums, lozenges, tablets, or gummies were the next most commonly used product. A postdoc working with me, Dr. Alyssa Harlow, has presented this critically, these critically important findings in a paper currently under review. Other postdocs post working with me, Dr. Aaron Vogel and Dehi Han, are working on related papers to understand the role of these new products among young people, including susceptibility to use and interest in using these products as a cessation aid. Notably, these new tobacco-free oral nicotine products were more common than use of a cigarette in our study. The use of tobacco-free oral nicotine products and their future in the U.S. market is an area for continued exploration. Last year, FDA permitted the marketing of Verve, the first oral product approved through the pre-market tobacco control application pathway. Lucy products and Velo products are currently under review, with more applications likely to come. So why worry about these new tobacco-free oral nicotine products? As you can see here, the marketing of these products varies markedly from traditional cessation products. And importantly, these products are not undergoing review for approval as a cessation aid through CEDAR. These products aren't your grandma's Nicorette gum. The advertisements are much cooler than this 1963 ad featuring an old cowboy. Newer O&P products are marketed with a much younger audience in mind. And we are continuing to observe marketing tactics that appear to try and circumvent FDA. For example, Zinn has two flavors of nicotine products that they are marketing as flavor ban approved, concerns with which we have outlined in another commentary led by Dr. Elena Tackett 
that has been preliminarily accepted at tobacco control. So what is next? We must continue to support those who want to quit smoking and continue to make gains in reducing the public health toll of tobacco products. This is my grandma who successfully quit smoking on June 19th, 2019 at the age of 82 after more than 60 years of smoking and countless quit attempts. And she continues to remain tobacco free. She, when I asked her what year she quit smoking, she told me June 19th. She's June 19th, 2019. Um, I could not be more proud of this amazing woman. She's just incredible. A year later, in May 2020, yes, in the middle of the pandemic, we adopted my two amazing daughters, Bella and Kalia, who were born in 2009 and 2011. And when I think about where we go and what we need to do next, I think about them and the next generation of kids. In fall of this year, both will be in middle school. How will we, in the tobacco control community, protect these kids and the many more to come without forgetting about those so desperate to quit smoking? How will we find balance and better the health of our communities? And where do we go from here? For me, a continued look into the next products, surveillance of how the market is changing and what the next big thing is. Research to change policy to protect our kids. And a renewed pursuit to continue to be sure that the future is bright. Because after all, the next generation of kids deserve to be protected. And ultimately, our goal collectively is to reduce and eliminate tobacco use and erase the harms to public health that the most deadly product ever legally produced has caused. With that, I would like to extend heartfelt appreciation to my amazing team, my many, many mentors who believed in me and provided guidance and support, especially Adam Leventhal and Rob McConnell, my colleagues and trainees who continually inspire me, my family and friends who make me laugh and keep me grounded. Thank you to my funders and the TRS program for supporting my research, and thank you very much to SRNT and those who nominated me for this award. I am honored to be here and speaking to you all, and I am filled with hope for our continued research and for the next generation of women in science. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, if anyone has questions. Yeah. Yes. Mike Cummings from the Medical University of South Carolina. First of all, congratulations on your award and a fabulous talk. Um, my question is, has your views about the gateway uh, question about uh, e-cigarettes as a gateway to, uh, you know, cigarette use uh, changed? Uh, given the population data that does not seem to support that with e-cigarette use uh, going up dramatically and cigarette consumption going down continually among adolescents and many new papers coming out uh, suggesting uh, common liability perhaps as uh, affecting that original estimate you came up with. Yeah, I, you know, I, this is a great question, and I think um, there is a tendency in science to try and be very black and white about everything, like either there is a gateway or there isn't a gateway, um, and I, I think the answer is more complicated than that, and I think as I have continued to do more research, I've become more open to the fact that the common liability hypothesis is probably in part true. The gateway hypothesis is probably in part true. Um, the weight of those relative things, I think we're still trying to figure out. Um, but uh, you know, I think the way forward is to, to stop, for all of us to sort of stop trying to dichotomize everything and just continue to learn as much as we can about what's happening. Suchitra Krishnan Saran from Yale. Thank you, Jessica. Congratulations. Wonderful talk. Can you expand a little bit more on what Mike just raised? You know, adolescence is always considered to be a risk continuum. 
where there are youth who are you know, risk prone to various things during this continuum period. And um, there is the thought that there may be some people who may move on to using other products, some children or youth who may just stay with e-cigarettes, and e-cigarettes in of themselves are not without harm. So perhaps you could speak to that. Um, yes, I will do my best. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what, what you're getting at, but it, you know, I think there, there's multiple things that we need to look at, right? I'm an epidemiologist, so I, I tend to focus on population level trends, and you know, I think it's it's worth understanding on a population level what is happening and how each of these things are sort of weighing in. On an individual level, I mean, you know, we have different kids. We have kids who are never ever going to use a tobacco product. Their friend will hand something to them and they'll be like, no, I'm, no, of course not. Um, and then there's kids who, no matter what we do, will probably always try something, whatever it is. And then a big group of kids who are in the middle. And those are the kids that I think we, as, as scientists, can really influence in the research that we're doing and in the policies that we help to develop to protect those kids who maybe are in between and maybe swayed in one direction or another um, for whatever reason. Congratulations, Jessica, that was great. Ryan Kennedy, Johns Hopkins. Can you um, talk a little bit about what and how you might think young people are attracted to synthetic, synthetic nicotine? Is it like a premium perception or trust in science? Or um, what do you think the appeal is for younger people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, you know, I think we don't have the answer to that yet. Um, we have some hypotheses. Um, you know, in some places, synthetic nicotine is being marketed as like a clean nicotine that doesn't have, you know, it's not associated with the like quote unquote dirtiness of combustible tobacco. Um, and then there's also the, the, just the phrase like tobacco free. Um, I think for kids who, who do not have a lot of experience with um, with vaping or with tobacco product use, and maybe even for those who do, um, hearing you know when you're looking at a product that says, "Oh, this is tobacco free," I think it connotes uh, this idea of a safer, reduced harm product, even even though we we don't know at all whether that's that's the case. Great question. Hi, uh, Rafael Mesa, University of Michigan. Congratulations, Jessica and the award and. Great talk. Um, I'm curious if, um, like, FDA presented the NYTS results, and they say don't compare it with previous years, because uh, of course there's there's, there's significant lower uh, um, uh, prevalence of of e -sig use. Um, so I was wondering if in the in the studies that you're doing in California, you've also seen that decrease in, in e -sig use from the previous years to, to, to the, I guess, the pandemic years, and if, if then that could suggest that it's actually happening or, or not. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question and one that I think we all want to know the answer to. Um, and as, as we get more data in 2022 and 2023 and onward, we'll, we'll have a better idea of, of what is actually happening. Um, I think, honestly, it doesn't matter what study you have, whether it's Monitoring the Future or NYTS or local studies, um, we just can't, we have no idea why the rate of e-cigarette use may be lower in 2021, um, or even in, in 2022 if data were collected after the pandemic began. Um, we, just, we just don't know. Like, is it, due, is it due to just fewer kids using e-cigarettes? Is it due to kids under-reporting because their parents are watching over their shoulder looking at how they answer the survey? I mean, we, we don't have data yet to know, and I don't know that we, that we will until we have a few more years. But, but you're also finding the decrease in, in the California surveys you're doing. I mean, it's, we don't, we don't, I, 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 that's a great question. I honestly haven't done like a side by side comparison with our 2021 um, cohort data and earlier cohorts from people who were the same age. Yeah. So I can't tell. I, I don't know offhand. Okay. Um, but yeah, my, my sense would be it's lower overall. But why why it's lower? Whether it's because of underreporting or actual like, reduction in use, and whether it will go back up as kids go back to school, we, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Thank you. But great question. Hey, Ben Toll from the Medical University of South Carolina. Great talk, Jessica, congrats. I'm so thrilled that you were selected and it's just such a, a great thing to see you up there and it's 
you know, fascinating data. I guess I'd love it if you could speak about what you perceive as the abuse liability of these nicotine cellulose pouches like Zen. I know that there's some user data. I went into a deep Reddit hole about how you can snort the powder inside, you can pour the powder on your tongue and gums. There's all these things that you can do if, not, if it's not used properly. And so I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, so far, we have not seen very high prevalence of the, the pouches, so like Zen or Velo or On. Um, we've, we've seen higher prevalence for the, the things that are a little bit more uh, accessible and common, like the nicotine-flavored gums, like Lucy-flavored gums, and the lozenges, and things that are just easy to use. Um, you know, I, NYTS, I think for the first time, included data on the pouches in their survey this year. Um, if I remember correctly, please don't quote me on this, it was about the same as cigarette use. Um, so I think, you know, we need, to, we need to learn more, of course. This is the answer to all my questions. We just, we need more research. We need to learn more. Um, it might be a secret ploy to get more funding. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, like I think the concern is there. I think we need to be on top of it. I think we need to continue to study what is happening and how kids are using these, both through quantitative data, but then also actually talking with, uh, with young people about what they're doing. Great, thank you. Hello, this is Nao Skamaguchi from USC. Um, congrats, Dr. Barrington Trimis. Um, so my, my question, I'm wondering if, um, I think there are increasing numbers of high schools and middle schools maybe, um, and maybe younger as well, that have e-cigarette education in their classrooms. And I'm wondering, one, if in the cohort that you're investigating, if there was any consideration of schools that do have those educational opportunities and how that impacted the um, ultimate use of e-cigarettes. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And Nasuke, you're supposed to ask those questions like when we're in our lab meetings, not here in front of everyone. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know that we know much yet about what educational programs are doing. Um, in California, where we do most of our research, um, almost all, maybe all public high schools have some sort of requirement in, in both middle school and high school to provide education, and all of those um, now focus uh, like pretty heavily on vaping. Um, you know, I think it, it's worth looking into which programs might be might be working better than others at helping um, helping kids to to not use any nicotine products. Um, so, an area for future research. Hello. Okay, um, it's magic. Um, this might be a. This is a, a high bar, but um, you mentioned that Biden just signed the synthetic nicotine changes, and I was wondering, and especially for people who maybe kind of learning about that for the first time, if you could talk about what you think that means for market shifts going forward or industry response, um, what the implications of that are. Yeah, that's that's a great question and a tough one. Thanks, Tracy. Um, you know, like again, I think I think we'll see. Um, I was really worried. I mean, we we wrote a commentary about this um, that e-cigarette companies would try and use the synthetic nicotine, like quote unquote, loophole to evade some of the policies that FDA was trying to put in place. Um, and Mitch, you know, a couple days ago uh, showed this wonderful quote using some pretty explicit language regarding the FDA and, and um, the fact that they had switched over to synthetic nicotine specifically to evade FDA regulation. Um, you know, I think with, uh, with this coming into play sometime in the next um, six months or so, I think four months or so, um, you know, it, it's, it's good that FDA sort of has authority over all nicotine products. And I think comprehensively, whether nicotine comes from synthetic places or from tobacco-derived plant, nicotine is nicotine. And if it's being used as a tobacco product, I think it makes sense to regulate it as a tobacco product. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I haven't seen any advertisement of tobacco-free products in California, um, and that could be because synthetic nicotine was already in, um, included in our state laws. 
Um, but you know, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens in in the next year, and you know, maybe others in the audience can report on this next year at SRNT. Are there any other questions for Jessica? All right, let's give Jessica one more round of applause and congratulations. <laughs>